So today we're continuing in our series in the book of Mark, a series entitled um, Jesus the Man Who Is More. And today's particular um, sermon message title is Jesus the Man Who Knows the Heart. Jesus the Man Who Knows the Heart. One of the, the greatest objections that the world has had against Christianity is that the church is full of hypocrites. I'm sure you've heard of that accusation before. A scandal of immorality in the church makes the headlines, or in business, a person says they are a Christian, but does you in. So sadly, in some cases, it is true that they are hypocrites. But for the most part, that kind of slander against the church is an exaggeration. It is a, it is a caricature, of course. But nonetheless, it, it does leave room for us, doesn't it, I think, to examine our lives. For whether on one hand we might be blind to the inconsistencies that are there between our belief and between our behavior, that can be real. Or whether, on, on the other hand, we might be guilty of kind of presenting a holier-than-thou kind of attitude, which is also easy to be guilty of in the church. So it is good, I think, that we examine our hearts on this matter, because so easily there can be layers of self-righteousness that are deeper than what we realize in our hearts. It's like a cancer. You, you don't know it's there. You can't see it because it's right inside the cells of your body almost. Yet it is there and it is slowly destroying some or other vital organ. And so it is with self-righteousness. It can almost be invisible to us, but all the while it is there, killing our spiritual vitality and even keeping us under false assurance. And so in today's message, as we continue in Mark's gospel, we see just how seriously and directly Jesus deals with the spiritual plague. For while we may be blind to it, he is not. Because Jesus is the man who knows the heart. So let's turn together to this pivotal chapter in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 7, which is probably the longest section of teaching bound together in Mark's gospel from Jesus. And therefore it is a significant passage not one that we can quickly overlook. So Jesus is dealing head-on, as we will see, with the Pharisees, in particular, on this matter of self-righteousness. So let's read from verse 1 of chapter 7 through to verse 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem... They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? By, by eating with defiled hands. And Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And then he continued to say to them, 
You have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother, m- mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, or mother thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And then he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride. Foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Well, you can appreciate the the tension (laughs) that must have been in the room, as it were, as this encounter went down. But so to set the scene, you recall last time we saw how Jesus had walked on the water. Um, as he met the disciples who were struggling out on the Sea of Galilee against a strong wind. And as he stepped into the boat with the disciples, so the wind stopped. And it was indeed a, a miracle upon miracles. And eventually then, they, they got to shore. But where they landed was nowhere near Jesus intended for them initially to go to when he sent them out that evening. Um, In fact, they almost landed in the opposite place, on the western shore of Galilee. And so where where they landed was very much in the heart of where Jesus had already been ministering. And so we can appreciate what happened as you read at the end of chapter 6, that as Jesus landed on the shore, well, the crowds were there again, ready to meet him. And and Jesus then gladly welcomed the crowds, and he he willingly healed them. We We are told that he healed many. Um, at the end of chapter 6, verse 56, and wherever he came in the villages and cities or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored Jesus that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched him, touched him were made well. And so Jesus performed many miracles of healing. And, and again, you notice how paramount his power is that they even just touched the fringe of his garments. And we're healed. And so, and so we just see again how, how no sickness was, was a match for Jesus and his power and his compassion. And he healed many. And now in the midst of this, in light of Jesus getting more and more attention um, amongst the people and, and amongst the crowds, it only then raised more and more concern amongst the Pharisees and amongst the scribes. They, of course, were not happy with this. And so the Pharisees and the scribes, we are told in chapter 7, verse 1, um, the Jewish leaders, that is, the heavyweights came to, to see Jesus. They walked over 100 miles or so from Jerusalem up into Galilee where Jesus was to, to speak with them um, and to see him, but, but not so much for healing, but rather to question him, to interrogate him. And so we have seen this opposition, you may recall, from the Jewish establishments and leaders already. Um, It came to something of a head back in chapter 3 at the end there, where the last time they encountered one another, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes left, you recall, to do what? Plotting to kill Jesus. And so in their mind, Jesus already had a, a target on his back. And so their intention here wasn't to get to him like the people were doing. 
The intention was to try and get rid of him. And as they did so, they were confronted here, as Jesus always did, coming out on top in the end. They were confronted, the Pharisees were, with the shocking reality of hypocrisy that was in their lives and how insidious self-righteousness can be. That is, within their hearts, what was really going on inside of them became exposed. And so, today, as we unpack this passage, there are really two parts that I want us to consider. The first is the self-righteous heart, and then the second is the righteous heart. Now, for us, as, we, as we've kind of got some of the background and read this passage, you, you may have come into your mind that, that well-known parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector that, that Jesus tells elsewhere. And, and many of you, I'm sure, as you've, as you've read that parable, would immediately conclude that and, and align yourself with who? The Pharisee, right? No. <laughs> you align yourself with the tax collector, don't you? You see yourself as the guy begging Jesus for mercy. And instinctively, we are there probably judging the Pharisees, saying, how can this bloke do that? How can he see be so outwardly crass and outwardly kind of legalistic and self-righteous? But here's the thing we're going to see today, is that we should not be so quick to think we are not the Pharisee and that we are always that beggar and tax collector. No, no, no. Just like these Pharisees, self-righteousness can be far deeper in our hearts than what we realize. So let's expose that, as Jesus does, the nature of this self-righteous heart as he exposes the Pharisees. Four things I want us to notice then about the self-righteous heart this morning. Firstly, you notice it is judgmental. The Pharisees confront Jesus about what? About the matter of his disciples eating without washing their hands. Now that should cause you to ask a question, isn't it? Which is what? Well, how did they know that the disciples were eating without washing their hands? Clearly, they were doing what? They were on the prowl. They were were on the lookout. They were looking to see faults. They were looking to try and see where they could get some dirt, pardon the pun. They were trying to see where they could catch Jesus and the disciples out. And so they were watching them all the time until they slipped up, so they thought. And, And that's exactly it. They had a critical spirit, isn't it? And that's so characteristic of a self-righteous heart, is to be judgmental and critical. Now, for you and us, we may be, you and I, we may be thinking, well, we're not exactly like that. We don't like the Pharisees going around spying on people. We may spy on our neighbors, but that's just another thing altogether. We don't just generally go around spying on people. But the question is not so much that as what is really, though, going on in our minds as we see people, and as we think about people. That's really the question. Have we not sometimes perhaps thought, sure, I would never do that. Or I would never be so foolish. Or even, I would never let my kids do that. Or I would never spend my money like that, etc., etc. You see, this reality of of a judgmental heart is, is not so much necessarily in what we're doing with our eyes, but it's more so what's happening inside of us. It's more so an attitude that is there in our hearts. It's more so how we notice more about what others are doing wrong than what we might be doing wrong. It's so easy to do. It's an attitude where we subtly think, well, we are better. In fact, if you've ever kind of sought to examine your own heart sometimes on when you've said things that have been judgmental about others and then considered your own actions, you may have found that very often the things that you are calling other people out on, you yourself ironically are also guilty of. And he has a confession. My driving remains to be fine-tuned still even after driving for 30 years. No, that will make me, no, not 30 years, 27 years. I found myself before as I'm approaching a four-way stop street um, and noticing someone coming in from the right and then noticing that they do not stop at all but almost continue through the stop street seamlessly as if I wasn't there. And there was a very good chance that I was, in fact, there before them, but they just go through. And immediately I feel myself getting my back up and like staring at them as they drive past as if it's going to do anything. 
only to find myself at two stop stops later, not concentrating, and there I go, cruising through the stop street, hardly even stopping. Guilty of the same thing. It happens, doesn't it? All the time. You see, we are more judgmental than what we are like, than what we like to think we are like, and we need to be careful. Just like these Pharisees were looking for where others are doing wrong instead of examining more our own hearts. Secondly, characteristic is that the, the, the self-righteous heart is often then traditional, literally as these Pharisees were, that they were very traditional, that they were very much bound by what? Bound by their own rules, bound by the tradition of the elders, as Jesus keeps on referring to, bound by their man-made rules rather than what? God's commands. And they failed to see the difference. They failed to see that. You see, they, they love rule-making. They love making more and more laws for people to keep, thereby giving themselves more and more reason to feel righteous because they think they're keeping them. They like to add to God's commandments so that their checklist looks more impressive, so that less and less people perhaps can actually keep up to that standard. You see, they, they kind of measure their holiness by the number of rules that they can keep. Very traditional, very legalistic in that sense. Now, you and I, again, may not be trying to rewrite the church constitution or trying to make a case for an 11th commandment, but we all, again, in our minds, unconsciously have extra rules that we even put on the same level as the Bible. Like I was reminded this week that it is a sin to put butter on a sandwich that you're also putting peanut butter on. Some of you may feel the same. I was reprimanded about that. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, we have all these kind of weird and wonderful rules. But more seriously, it, it's happened in the church, hasn't it? And within denominations, as denominations have added requirements for Christians to keep and almost making them carry the same weight as the Bible. Have we not lived through, through this whole kind of um, um, phase of, of, of church dress and having to wear hats or having to wear pants or having to wear ties or church songs? You can only sing hymns, or you must never sing hymns. I mean, it's crazy. Or how we feel we cannot contextualize what we do in church at all because that will be compromise, um, and we cannot do that because we will be like the world around us. And so in so many ways, tradition ends up behinding us and be directing our lives more than God's commands. But not just in the church. I mean, at, a, at just a, a personal level, at, a, at an everyday Christian life kind of level, we can have our sacred cows can't we? How we, we make some things carry more weight than what they should. TV in the house versus no TV in the house. Public school versus home school. Shopping on a Sunday versus no shopping on a Sunday. And do you know what I'm talking about? It's those kind of categories we have in our minds that we judge others by in the church, where certainly there's no law in the Bible about and so we can easily make personal convictions, which are okay to have, but we can easily make those things universal stipulations. And so easily we can move then third order or fourth order or fifth order issues up into the level of first order. Thou shalt not. And so we can be guilty of adding extra hoops for people to jump through, not for the sake of meeting God's standards, but for the sake of meeting our standard. So, one way or other, we can easily fall into the trap of tradition. And so, the self-righteous heart is judgmental, in critical, is traditional, making up plenty of their own rules. More so, thirdly, the, the self-righteous heart is superficial. You notice that Jesus calls them out, quoting from Isaiah here, in how um, they are like those who honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from them. He applies that same judgment that Isaiah applied to God's people, the people of Israel back then, to these Pharisees, where they would take their sacrifice to the temple all the time, all the while they were busy committing idolatry during the rest of the week and bowing down to an Asherah pole, or all the while oppressing the poor. And so he's saying these Pharisees were guilty of the same. They were guilty of keeping laws on the outside, but underneath, it was a completely different story. I mean, elsewhere, Jesus, you know, makes that scathing remark to, of them, calling them whitewashed tombs. I mean, how much more vivid a description do you need to get 
of what self-righteousness really is. It's all about the outside. It's all about external. Um, and with that, it's just, it's just all artificial. It's just all superficial. I mean, and so they were, you see, they were picking out the disciples for, for what? For not washing their hands. Not cleaning physically on the outside, right? In fact, Mark then goes on to elaborate for us and for his readers, some of which who are Gentiles and are familiar with all of this Jewish practice, um, to explain some of the other things that they did. In verse 4, And there are many other traditions that you observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and, and even the dining couches. And so you notice it's all about cleaning things where? On the outside. The cups and the pots. It's all external. It's all superficial. It's exactly what Paul writes in, in Corinthians, I mean in Colossians chapter 2, where he says, where they again, where the churches there were, were, were tempted to um, follow man made regulations and, and, and submit themselves to, to, to external rules. He writes, Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those which are according to human precepts and teachings. For these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but in the end they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Exactly. They're simply superficial, they simply clean the outside. But that's it. That's all they do. And how our hearts have an affinity for that, for, for just looking good on the outside, not so. For just making sure we look okay to others so easily. Because it's, it's so much more manageable, it's so much easier to clean up the outside. So much easier to just follow one or two or five rules and think we are okay. I mean, doesn't this very situation we're under, it's incredible, this coronavirus pandemic and, and all the cleaning that we are doing provide us with a living parable for what is true of us spiritually. I mean, I even saw Wayne when he came in this morning, washing not just his hands, but even up to his elbows. Um, so I'm not quite sure if that's the next thing we've got to do. Um, I must check it with you on after, afterwards, Wayne. But, I mean, that's it. it. It's exactly what we spiritually think we can do. We can clean up the outside. As if it's going to, going to help us. As if it's going to protect us. As if it's going to make us right before God. And that's how much effort we go to. All the washing and daily cleaning of our hands that we're doing now, and all the other deep cleaning of, of buildings and all of that, it's just how far we do go spiritually to try and make ourselves clean before God on the outside. How false and how misleading and, and how misinformed to quote Charles Spurgeon here, who said, to cover up the sun would be easy work compared with covering up sin. Exactly right. But the self-righteous heart doesn't recognize that. Thinks it's just about the outside, just superficial. So long as that's clean, I'm okay. So judgmental, traditional, superficial, and then lastly, ultimately, hypocritical. You notice Jesus directly accuses them and calls them hypocrites. They were pretending to be on the outside, did not match what was really going on on the inside. To quote one commentator here who writes, when Jesus refers to the Pharisees as hypocrites, he takes a term from the theater, meaning to play a part on stage. Especially in Greek theater, actors wore various masks according to the roles they impersonated. So the word hypocrite, accordingly, comes to mean someone who acts a role without sincerity, hence a pretender. Again, just like we're all wearing these masks right now, covering up what's sort of underneath. Isn't that how we often live life? Is that we do put our best foot forward. We, we do cover up who we really are inside, what's really going on, what's really happening on the dark, what's really happening when we're alone, what's really happening at home. We, we arrive at church and all's okay, but, but little, little do we know of the chaos that happened in the car on the way here, 
between husband and wife or between parents and children. We, we like to pretend that, that we are perfect when we are not. It's so easy. And so, so easily we can allow with that our own regulations to replace the very commandments of God, which is just what Jesus accuses these Pharisees of doing here. That self-righteousness can, can go so far that it actually gets in the way of us doing the right thing. Our self-righteousness can go so far that it actually gets in the way of us doing the right thing, which is what these Pharisees were guilty of. Jesus points out one example of how they, um, how they um, allowed people to, to pay this, this korban, which was a regulation made up um, where they could set aside money if they had extra property or an extra field as dedicated to God so that no one else could touch it um, and that it would be, in that sense, safe. But, but in doing that, then, that money was, in theory, not available to then be used if another crisis or another need came up, which is what he expressed here. That in some cases, people had parents, mothers and fathers, who were in need, who, who were needing financial, physical, material assistance, who were needing food, for example. But then they were taking this Corban rule as a cop-out, saying, well, my money all, is all bound up in Corban. It's, it's been dedicated to, to God. It's been dedicated to the temple. And so I cannot use it. I cannot help it. And they thought that as a way of being justified. Well, it's, I've done the more spiritual thing. I've dedicated my money to God. But meantime, there's a need right on their doorstep. In fact, there's a commandment. Honor your mother and father, the fifth commandment that they're breaking. By so-called doing the the greater spiritual thing. In fact, what they are simply doing is they are breaking the greater law, the primary law, honor your mother and father, by keeping their man-made laws and regulations. And so they had allowed the extra regulation and law-keeping to eclipse the very word and law of God. So much so that, that in some cases, parents were suffering. I mean, it's obviously so foolish, but that's what happens. It becomes about the letter of the law. It becomes about just keeping it right on the outside and it, to the point that it actually prevents you from doing what is right. I mean, Jesus makes it plain where he says they have made void the word of God by their traditions. He says again, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your traditions. Do you see what he's saying is that they are, that they are so foolish and so blind and so hypocritical that they are, in fact, ignoring God's Word and just sticking to their Word, and all the while believing they're okay in doing that. And that's what happens. We end up straining the net, all the while swallowing the camel. But how sad, for it is exactly as Thomas, Purit Thomas Watson, a Puritan, writes, the hypocrite deceives others while he lives, but deceives himself when he dies. And that's what's going to happen to everyone who is in their self-righteousness thought that that's how they're going to get to God. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, yo, that's quite a lot, and you get all of that, though, and understand all of that, and as terrible as that sounds... Um, that's not a real problem for you. That Certainly your heart is not that bad. Your heart is not so openly judgmental or, or hypocritical like that. Um, and while, yes, certainly the Pharisees were obvious candidates for this kind of accusation and behavior, we know that that's what characterized them. Um, but it's more deceiving than we realize, you see. I mean, these Pharisees were devoted. They really thought that they were, on one hand, doing a good thing. They really believed they were doing a right thing. They were committed to it. They were committed more than what we probably are committed to, to our system of our spirituality. They were completely committed, doing everything, doing all the praying and all the giving and all the outward stuff, completely committed. So you couldn't fault them on their devotion. Sometimes we can be very devoted, but you're completely wrong. Because notice that Jesus then calls the people together to, to teach them, to explain to the people. Obviously, in his mind, he was aware that not just the Pharisees 
could be going wrong here, that all the crowds could be going wrong here. And so he called them aside in verse 14 to explain exactly what he is saying. That therefore it is not what goes into you that makes you clean. And so you can't just clean up the outside. You can't just even, for example, eat all the right foods and think you're okay. Because that just goes through your stomach and out again. But no, it's what, what is inside of you that comes out. That's what makes you unclean. It's, it's therefore within your heart. And so he, he teaches the people. But then you notice the disciples, when they are later with Jesus, ask Jesus to do what? To explain that parable. It's like, what? Can you be so dull? That's what Jesus says to them. I mean, are you still of no understanding? Can't you get it that what you eat can't contaminate you? It just goes through you. But it's what's inside of you that contaminates you. It's there that the dirt lies. They couldn't even understand it. And so let's not be self-righteous in thinking we are not guilty of self-righteousness. Because for one, our sinful pride is always trying to convince us otherwise, to think that we are okay. Because it's difficult for us to assess and accept what our hearts are really, really like, that they're not necessarily good. I mean, just think about how often you respond to your spouse, to your husband or to your wife when they correct you. Do you immediately say, oh, honey, you are so right. Thank you so much for exposing my waywardness and my corrupt heart. Um, please forgive me. Um, and can I cook you supper for the rest of this week? Is that how we respond? Or when you correct your children, do they come and say, I am so blessed to have such wise parents who know exactly when I go wrong and always tell me the right thing to do. I am so thankful to God. I want to now spend an hour in prayer and thanksgiving. <laughs> Not at all. We all respond the same way when we are told that we are wrong. We get our backs up. We get defensive. We justify ourselves. Because why? Our hearts are proud. Our hearts are self-righteous. We don't acknowledge that we aren't as good as what we like to think we are. So don't think that you are not guilty here. But more than that, it's not just the problem inside of us. It's, it's all around outside of us. The world is trying to convince us that we're not really as bad as what we are. You see, we've got, we've got humanistic philosophy that is telling us all the time to believe in ourselves, that, that you have the potential, that you are great. Or there's secular psychology saying that you are never the problem, that it's your upbringing or your poverty that is to blame, that you've got to always nurture your self-image. You can never, ever say that somebody is guilty of doing anything wrong because it's self-image that is paramount. And so human psychology is, is forcing us to think that we are okay and everything else around us is what's wrong. Then you've got the whole worldview of, of modernism that is kind of separated in life, private and public. And they've kind of drawn a false dichotomy there so that what you do in private doesn't matter. You know, it's, it, it's just all what happens in public is okay. There's no connection there. Your personal life is separate. It's your own thing. It doesn't matter what happens there. I mean, have we not seen this, for example, in, 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 the, in, in the scandal and in, in the immorality and in the shame and in, in the corruption that has come out increasingly over the last 30 years amongst our leaders, from our presidents to our sports stars? You know, the character doesn't matter anymore. I mean, in the day, there were some genuine heroes in the sports world to follow, like Osturantz. <laughs> Who are the heroes today? Where do we look to? Because a leader or high profile, well, stands for nothing. And so we've got the whole, that, that whole concept that is, that is separating private from, from public. And then, and then added on that has come postmodernism where we are told, well, actually, there's no right and wrong. That the truth is all relative. It, it's how you feel that matters. So if it makes you happy, go for it. And so you do not see how, how we're just conditioned all the time to not ever see ourselves as as being bad. And that's just even reinforced more so by this consumer materialistic world that we live in with all the advertising and all the shopping. And it's telling us if you drive this car or if you wear these clothes, what? You deserve it. You'll be, you'll be successful. You'll feel good about yourself. Because that's what life's about. Did you know that? 
That's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt feel good about thou self. You see, and it's, that's what the world is convincing us of as well. And so let's not be naive thinking we cannot be guilty of falling into the self-righteous trap, this trap of having the self-righteous heart where it's all in the end, outside-in kind of cleansing. It's all outside-in cleansing. But does it work? No, it doesn't. It cannot. In so many ways, we are being saved to believe that we are not the problem. And Jesus makes it clear that we are, that it's, that it's out of our hearts that come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And so you should really be, you should be sitting here again thinking, so what hope do I have? How can I get such a, a righteous heart? How can I ever be clean from the inside out? How could that ever be possible? Well, it's firstly acknowledging, is it not, that that is what your heart is like. It is firstly accepting that none of the stuff, even the good stuff that we can do, will ever save us. That the stain in our heart is bigger and deeper than we think. That in other words, our problem isn't just our, our sinfulness as keeping us from God. Our problem is also our self-righteousness that is keeping us from God. And we need to acknowledge that. That as the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in us. And so as Martin Lloyd-Jones has written, the first sign of spiritual life is to feel that you are dead. And that's it. It's coming to that place of acknowledging the depth of your sinfulness and with that our inability to save ourselves, our inability to be righteous ourselves, that we need, we need something from the outside. We need a new heart. We need a, a new righteousness. That's what I need. I, need. I need something or someone else to make me clean from the inside out. And the only way to do that is as this story illustrates. A man received a knock on his door one day, and it was a delivery from UPS or FedEx. He wasn't all that surprised, though he hadn't expected anything because he often ordered books online and got them delivered. But this time, as the delivery guy brought the parcel, it wasn't a package of books, as he would have expected. It was an envelope. Um, and so he was then doubly surprised. And, and as he received the envelope, he noticed on the, the outside, it was from an organization called Be The Match. And he had never heard of this organization before and really wondered what this was all about. And so he opened the letter, and this is what he read. Dear Mr. Carter, we are writing to inform you that you have been identified as a possible match for a bone marrow transplant patient. It is urgent that you contact us so we can confirm whether you are a complete match. And when he read that, he thought, what? Where did they get my information from? How come I'm receiving this request to be a bone marrow, potential bone marrow donor? How do they get my blood and how do they get the information from me? How do they even know about me? And as he thought about it, he recalled 10 years earlier, a pastor friend of his had a daughter who had been diagnosed with leukemia, and they tried all their own family um, contacts to see if there was a match, and there wasn't. So their church had a, had a blood drive for anyone who would like to come and get tested to see if possibly they had a bone marrow match. And it was then that this Mr. Carter went and, and then had his, his blood sampled, and then as a result of that went on to this registry for this organization called Be The Match. 
Unfortunately, his blood nor any others tested that day were a match for this girl's bone marrow. Um, and so she continued to suffer for a couple more years. Um, and finally, um, she died when she was 12 years old from her leukemia. But now this letter was in front of him. And what was he to do? Because he knows that it is a painful exercise to go through a bone marrow transplant. Um, and what would it all involve? And um, how much of a disruption would it be? And um, what would be the cost implications, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But as you're thinking about that, he realized, but on the other hand, think about this girl, Christina, who he had tried to help previously. Think about what her parents would have wanted if he was positive. And so think about this new other person who's completely unknown to him, um, their parents or, or their family. Wouldn't they want, wouldn't he, if he was in this situation, if his daughter needed a, blown, a, blood, a bone marrow transplant, want someone, anyone who could help to put up their hand and help? And so he, of course, even as a Christian, was convinced he needs to do this. And so he, he made an appointment and he went to see the people at the local clinic. And when he arrived there, the nurse who attended was so surprised. He said, I can't believe you've actually responded because he, she said, no one normally responds to these kind of requests. I mean, it's just a, such a big ask, especially for someone you don't even know. And he said, no, well, I thought to that, but honestly, I need to be here because what if it was my own daughter? And so they, he went through the exercise and, and had the, the blood assessment done. Unfortunately, after all of that, his blood was not a match. And so he couldn't help this other person who was in need. Nevertheless, his name remains on the registry, and he may, as he said, receive another envelope overnight any day. But what that whole traumatic ideal made him think about, what it impressed upon him, he, went, he goes on to say, was just how precious blood is. That it literally is the difference between life and death. That his blood could have potentially saved, albeit just temporarily, the life of someone else. That's what it could have done. His blood could have saved someone else's life. And then he realized, how much more then is it not so that we are saved unto eternal life through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That that's what he has done for us. That his sacrifice, his blood, has given us life that is eternal. That it's through his cleansing blood that our sins are completely washed away. That our hearts are completely purified and made new. That we are able to then stand completely holy and blameless before God. And so with fresh perspective, he realized how precious Jesus' blood is that has washed him completely clean. And that's it, isn't it? That's the only way that we can be made righteous is through the purifying, sanctifying, once-for-all cleansing, sacrifice, and bloodshed by Jesus Christ. That can wash the deepest stain away. That can, as the hymn writer writes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This all my righteousness. What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus is implied declaring here, where Mark makes this footnote when he says that Jesus declared by this all foods clean. And so in that he was pointing us to this very reality that Jesus has come to fulfill all those cleansing, all those ceremonial laws of outward purification. 
He's come to do away with all of that and fulfill that by Himself shedding His blood to cleanse us once and for all. So that no longer matters about washing hands and cleaning pots and being ritually clean because we've been washed once and for all by His blood. So don't you see that that's the only way you can be clean? It's the only way you can be clean. And have you come to Him to clean you? And I realize some may be feeling here perhaps the opposite. Perhaps you're feeling that you're all too aware of your sin. That you know how bad your heart is. Some days you feel you can't live with yourself. What we need to appreciate is that while such contrition and brokenness is good, it can also equally be false. It can just be self-pity or self-abasement. It can amount simply to false humility, pride in our weakness of sin, almost. I'm so bad, I'm always going to be so bad, and so won't somebody praise me for my self-awareness? And so we've got to be careful that we don't unduly beat ourselves over the back and fall into self-righteousness on that edge, on that side. Because if it is true humility, what should happen? Well, it should lead us to repentance because of the blood of Jesus and to freedom and to change. That's what it should do if we've really appropriated it in the gospel. It shouldn't lead us to bondage and self-loathing. If we've accepted the gospel, then what? Jesus has washed our stain away. And we have His perfect righteousness. And so if we believe that we need to look to Him and, and run to Him, for the Son, for whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. That's our hope in the gospel. As someone has written, are you too bad to receive grace? How could you be too bad to receive what is for the bad? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So where is our living focus then? Where are we perhaps trying to cover up? Because none of that's going to do. Gerot was, was fearful about standing up and sharing naked before you this morning. We can appreciate that. Imagine that. Gosh, I would die. You would die. But surely, how much worse do you think we can stand before God with our so-called self-righteous acts? We are more than naked like that. It's only been robed in the righteousness of Christ that we can stand clothed before God. So let's be examining our hearts to see where we are trying to please man more than God. Where might we be pretending? And so therefore, where do we need to confess? Where do we need to own up? Where do we need to admit our self-righteousness and say sorry for our sinfulness? Are we concerned about our attitudes as well as our actions? Right now, perhaps, right now, perhaps, God is convicting you. Where? And if He is, Respond in repentance and in faith. Jesus is the man who knows our hearts. So we can hide nothing from him. But let's not forget, he is also the man who gives us a brand new heart that we might live for him. Let us pray. How we thank you, our God and Father, for this wonderful salvation for this precious blood that has come through your Son, that cleanses us once and for all, washes us whiter than snow. O oh God, deliver us in, from our own blindness and self-deceit, from our own sense of self-righteousness and pride that lurks in our hearts. 
And Lord, may we live lives that are truly an embodiment of the grace and the mercy and the love and the righteousness that we have received. Loves that imitate Christ. Loves that are, that are holy as we walk in step with Him. As His love fills us and transforms us to live lives worthy of the gospel. Our Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in our hearts for your glory. Amen.